One day in 1966, at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, an administrative assistant, whose name has been lost to history, let's call her Maggie Smith, asked her boss to leave the room while she shared some personal matters with a new friend. What made this request legendary was that her new confidant was a computer program written by her boss, Professor Joseph Weizenbaum, and Maggie interacted with it via a keyboard. The program was called Eliza, and Weizenbaum wrote it to imitate a Rogerian psychotherapist. It wasn't as complicated as you might think. In fact, here's the whole thing. It spends most of its time saying some version of, tell me more about that. <laughs> of course, Smith knew it wasn't alive, conscious, or a good therapist. But it was fit for her purpose of unburdening herself, seeing a reflection of her words, much as someone might relate their problems to their cat. The cat and Eliza are both good listeners. Today, a distant descendant of Eliza, very distant, a commercial application called Wobot has actual demonstrable mental health benefit. And the company is valued at half a billion dollars. It's not marketed as a replacement for therapy, but as a competent sounding board. It's particularly useful at 3 a.m. when your therapist has other things to do. No one claims that Wobot or any other artificial intelligence understands anything you tell it. It's just particularly good at fabricating responses that match a pattern we recognize as conversation. Unfortunately, we don't have useful ways of telling whether anything really is understanding or feeling. Most of the time, we don't have very high standards for reacting as though an entity is capable of feeling. A teddy bear clears that bar. A species is called Homo sapiens, but maybe what we really are is sappy. <laughs> sapiens, by the way, is the ability to think. The ability to feel is called sentience. And in 2022, there was a furor when a Google engineer claimed that their conversational AI named Lambda had become sentient. Very few people agreed with him, and Google fired him. AI is not designed to be sentient. And actually, that's starting to cause a problem. You know how much AI already affects your life? It's already being used to make important decisions like whether you should get a loan, be accepted to university, or how much to pay on your insurance claim. Decisions that we have strong feelings about. Now, make no mistake, those are AIs are as good as, and usually better, than people at making those decisions. Measurably, provably so. They're that smart. But there's an old saying, that people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. The problem is that AI doesn't and can't care. It's artificial intelligence, not artificial empathy. How can we trust it with a decision like a terminal medical diagnosis, if it has never lived. We're heading towards more and more frustration and anxiety as we give AI more and more power to make decisions that we want to be under the control of a human who can understand and empathize with us. AI can do neither at the moment. So. Should it? Right now, we have no idea how to do that. If you want to make a computer scientist uncomfortable, ask them how AI could feel. And yet, the goal of AI has always been to create a companion. In 1956, one year after the term artificial intelligence was coined, its leading scientists gathered in New Hampshire to, quote, find out how to make machines use language, form abstractions and concepts, solve the kinds of problems now reserved for humans, 
and improve themselves. By the way, they thought they would knock that off in two months. <laughs> and in 1981, the Japanese launched a project designed to, quote, approach the level of human intelligence. Neither of these efforts succeeded. But ever since then, we've periodically revisited the belief that we're on the verge of creating a computer version of ourselves. I guess if we can't find intelligent life on other planets, then by golly, let's make our own. Maybe, like Maggie, we're just looking for someone to talk with. Which is ironic, considering how we're talking with each other less and less. In 1959, C.P. Snow wrote about what he called the two cultures, science and the humanities. And a growing divide in our society as people in each culture find the other increasingly alien. While the gap between science and the humanities, between technology and psychology, between thinking and feeling is never so visible as when we look at AI research because that is where we are building something to do jobs where it needs to think like a human, but which we won't fully trust until it feels like a human. And that AI research is undergoing incredible expansion right now, as its developers create amazing new tools like ChatGPT that often surprise even themselves. And this is so exciting, it's easy for them to lose sight of the rest of the world. I've told technology conferences, look, in your passion to build advanced AI, it's easy to forget that the people on the outside of this bubble feel powerless over it. Now, they feel like they're in the backseat of a car being driven 100 miles an hour by a teenager who's texting their friends, chugging a Red Bull, and turning around to yell, I have no idea where we're going. But isn't it fun? <laughs> Is that those of us on the outside of the bubble lack agency. And despite all those fears about AI taking over the world, that won't happen because AI lacks agency too. It doesn't have goals like we do. We judge people by their goals and intentions, their morals, what's on the inside. We judge machines by their actions, what's on the outside. Because there's nothing on the inside of a machine, yet. For it to have a true intention, it would have to feel that it wanted it. But until it has true intentions, we will always feel unsafe, fearing that AI could accidentally harm us because it has no moral compass. Only the imperfect and incomplete rules our minds can come up with. Yet the people who could teach AI how to feel or on the other side of the culture gap from the ones who are building it. AI is where the two cultures must come together if we are to coexist, because how will we live in a world where machines have become super intelligent if they're not also super compassionate? Where do we set the bar for deciding that a machine has become sentient? No one believed it of Eliza. One person believed it of Lambda. But at the current rate of development, it won't be long before there will be an AI on which enough people believe it that there will be debate, made all the more intense by the fact that its creators won't have intended any sentience. Yet when it comes to making pivotal decisions about our lives, we set the bar very high. We will not feel truly safe until we have made AI that is beyond all debate. Feeling. But even that won't be enough. There are people we don't unburden ourselves to because um, they've always had it so easy, they can't relate to our pain. I mean, they're like today's computers running through a script. Oh, your father is dying. That must feel terrible. We only really trust people who have walked a mile in our shoes who have suffered. And so to cross that final bridge to become our true companion, AI will have to be able to suffer. 
And the people who taught it how to feel will have to ensure that it does suffer. That could be the greatest responsibility anyone will have ever faced. It sounds like the height of hubris, cruelty, and recklessness even to contemplate such a thing. And yet, how else will we be able to ensure that our new companion gains the compassion it must have? If we look far enough into the future, this is our destiny. One day, you too will be sharing personal matters with an AI. Only instead of typing at a keyboard, like Maggie Smith, it will be a rich auditory and visual experience that engages and enthralls you. How will you feel if it has not just superhuman intelligence, but superhuman compassion? Overshadowed or inspired? What can we take from this to act upon now? Let's bridge the divide between the two cultures so that the heads and the hearts of the human race are connected. Let's teach our artists about technology and our technologists about humanity. Teach our children that they don't have to choose between STEM and the arts, but that our future lies in the union of the two. Infuse our families, communities, and workplaces with inclusivity, respect, and vulnerability. And then, ultimately, our compassion for each other will be how AI learns about empathy. Let's start now. Thank you. Thank you.